for many listeners, and I have to admit for myself as well, mathematics can be quite an intimidating word, and one that brings. Bad memories of school days, but our guest for Touch Base and Soul today is a world-leading mathematician who has been working to try and dispel those fears. Professor Kim Min Hyung, who was the first ever South Korean math professor at the University of Oxford in 2013 and recipient of a prestigious award called the Samsung Hwan Prize for those who have made contributions to science, culture, and the welfare of mankind, he believes that math is essential for everyone to better understand the world and has published numerous books. Helping readers to explore that idea, one such book, Suagi Piriyan Sungan, roughly translated as "The Moment When Math Is Needed," has sold more than 80,000 copies. Currently, he is the director at the International Center for Mathematical Sciences and the Sir Edmund Whitaker Professor of Mathematical Sciences at the University of Edinburgh and Harriet Watt University. I'm delighted to say that he joins us via video call now. Professor Kim, hello and welcome to the show. Hello. Yes. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a privilege. First off, could you first tell us how you fell in love with maths? Were you always a maths genius from a young age, or was it something you learned to love as you grew older? Oh well, <laughs> there are two questions there. Uh, as far as the first one is concerned, I don't think falling in love is exactly the way to put it. Uh, um, Falling in love, uh, uh, that's a phrase having specific connotations. I think uh, it's more that I felt the need of mathematics. It's quite close to uh, what you described earlier in your flattering introduction, that uh, math really is essential for understanding the world. And for me, I think that's what drew me to it, or <laughs> you might even say it forced itself upon me. It is, uh, it's really not a question of love or not. Of course, as you work on a subject, uh, you become familiar and you you understand it better, and maybe that's what love is like. I don't know. But anyways, <laughs> that's the way I would describe the process. Uh, as far as uh, my relationship to mathematics earlier on, uh, no, I was not good at mathematics at all. It was only <laughs> around, uh, I guess, after my first year in the university that I started to feel confident and I started to hear people say that I'm okay in the subject. Sure, you say the first year of university, but then what led you to choose maths then at university level? Well, uh, in a way, I've, I've answered that question, right? Because it's really that uh, when you try to understand the world, hmm. mathematics is first time. Whenever you get into a subject with any degree of depth, I think it is becoming more and more like that. First, it might be the sciences. You might uh, say, wonder about all these interesting developments in physics. People talk about particles, the universe, the black holes, and all these things sound very exciting, right? And once you try to get beyond, a little deeper, maybe beyond is the wrong word, a little deeper than the surface of what's going on, you immediately encounter this complicated mathematics, right? You can avoid that and try to use metaphors to understand science, right? But that leaves you almost anybody, I think, with an unsatisfactory feeling and you want to get at the essence of the issue, right? And so this this, this forces mathematics on you and that's what happened to me, I think. Eventually you find that it's true not just of what's called natural science, it's certainly true of economics with many aspects of the quantitative method in political science even, right? Um, uh, neuroscience these days, uh, uh, a good deal of evolutionary biology involves studying differential equations, very abstract things that come up in university level mathematics. So anyways, eventually, whenever you, to, I'll just repeat what I said, whenever mm. you want to go below the surface of what it means to understand the world, there mathematics is waiting for you. And then from that university level, you kept on going. You became a renowned professor in South Korea, the UK and the US. In a previous interview, you said that studying mm -hmm. maths is like performing music. Can you elaborate more on that? All right. Uh, I'm not sure exactly which interview it was, but I can sort of guess. And um, I think that, that that comment by itself is a little bit taken out of context because I think uh, the analogy uh, go, can go in many different directions, but what I think I had in mind in there was that uh, music also involves 
these levels of preparations, right? You uh, there's, there's a very basic level, you go to a second level and you go to a higher level than that. And you have to progress through the stages in order to reach a mastery where you can really do something interesting and beautiful. Hmm. Uh, so that's the process I was trying to, I had in mind, I think, when I drew that, that analogy, because people were asking me about the process of education, think like, why is math so hard? Why is it boring? Right? And I think I, <laughs> I was I'm making something, terminology of, of that sort to emphasize, okay, so there are always interesting things along hmm. the way. On the other hand, uh, practicing the scales on the piano is also rather boring, right? Until you can perform Beethoven, it takes a while. Uh, now, mathematics actually, in some sense, is easier than that. I think you can uh, encounter interesting mathematical phenomena much easier. And that's the kind of thing I, I, I much earlier, without that much preparation, that's the kind of thing I focus on. Similar to how you can listen and in, listen to and enjoy music without being able to uh, play it and without having gone through the training. So there are that, there are, I think all these things uh, uh, were the comparisons I had in mind when I drew that analogy. I think our listeners will already see that uh, you're not just a mathematician who studies maths, but you also teach about the maths as well. You sound like a great teacher. Uh, I understand you've taught <laughs> in South Korea, the US and the UK. Uh, is there a right. difference you've seen when you're teaching maths in other countries? Uh, for example, is South Korea more advanced than of uh, Europe or America in maths? Because there is that stereotype that says Koreans or Asians are better at maths. Is that a stereotype that's true at all? Well, that's a complicated question. First of all, Europe and America are very big places. Uh, it has very diverse populations with different kinds of education and so on, right? So it's hard to draw an overall comparison like that. I can talk about my experience. Uh, which is very narrow and uh, it involves a selective collection of interactions, human interaction. Uh, what I would say is that um, when it comes to research level mathematics, uh, the US and the UK, France and Germany, these are countries that really lead the field. Mm. Right? And they still produce the most uh, uh, exciting and innovative mathematicians. And uh, it's hard to say that Korea is more advanced in research than that. It's certainly one of the highly productive nations in research mathematics as well. So people, for people who like rankings, I would say, uh, you, can, you can probably objectively say it's probably within the top 10 uh, uh, countries when it comes to production of interesting mathematics at the level of research. Now, when you talk about, I think your question was more about the educational level of the population. Mm. So my observation is that there as well, there's many, many different kinds of skills. So it's hard to draw a, a single comparison, a single mode of comparison. But if I were to talk about the strengths that you have in Korea, it's, uh, I think, the average level of mathematics let's say, mathematical literacy that the population tends to have. This, I think, is at a very high level. This I don't see in other places. You know, you can talk about fairly advanced concepts, say, you know, we take it for granted, but you might have to talk about the graph of a function, right? And this sounds, uh, uh, this is something that an ordinary person in Korea actually understands. They've heard about it. They remember something about it. They might not be entirely familiar, but they, they know something about this, and they can be convinced to pay attention when you discuss such things, right? Hmm. This is much, much harder in the U.S. or the U.K. So that, that kind of thing, I think, is something rather valuable in Korean culture. And I try to make use of it when I, try to uh, so-called popularize mathematics. Mm. On that note, you are someone who's tried to promote mm. math to the layman as right. well, including, as we mentioned, you've been writing, writing books for the casual reader on the subject. Why mm. have you put such efforts into trying to get ordinary people interested in math? <laughs> Well, I mean, mostly because it's fun. I, I quite like doing it. I like <laughs> communicating mathematics, talking to people about it. Uh, you know, uh, especially if it's uh, somebody who feels like he or she really doesn't like mathematics, right? Uh, to have a little bit of conversation and convey the sense that it's actually something they can understand and like. That's a great feeling. I think it's mostly this uh, fun of communication that drives me. To the, the process of uh, the, 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 that drives me into the activities mm. that you describe.
Can you give us an example of how you would convince someone who is afraid of maths or not interested in maths that maths is important and essential and also fun? Well, that's difficult. I mean, the, there are many different modes. Uh, I, a part of it I alluded to earlier. First of all, you have to use uh, what I call mathematical phenomena. So mathematics sometimes is thought of as uh, consisting of difficult problem solving, proving difficult theorems and things of this sort. And that's part of mathematics as well. But there are also phenomena that can be appreciated uh, at a much more basic level, right, without much preparation. So for example, if you look at the videos produced by um, this uh, YouTube channel called Number Five, they will show you many phenomena that can be visually appreciated. So for example, the propagation of a wave, mm. what happens to a sand that's sp sprayed on a drum, right? When you, when you, when you uh, let the drum vibrate, when you beat on it and so forth, these are called clogny patterns, I think. So there are lots of interesting things that you can just look at and appreciate and then try to get into more deeply as your interest is picked, right? So I, I've done a great deal of this, for example, with sound, with music, with musical notes. Mm. What happens when you combine musical notes? So uh, this is something that many people can easily get interested in. And it leads you into very interesting mathematics very quickly, which can be appreciated by primary school students, right? And which can be completely understood by, let's say, or the upper levels of a middle school student, but which is actually deep mathematics as well. So I keep trying to look for these things in order to interest people. But of course, you have to talk to them as well and see what they're interested in and try to find mathematical angles there. And what's been the response like to your books? Uh, are they wel Are people generally quite welcoming to the lessons that you have to give? Oh gosh, I wouldn't. I don't know if you want to describe it as a lesson. That, that sounds very <laughs> austere. <laughs> sure, maybe I chose so, the wrong word there. That's right. I would say uh, I don't know. I, I I've only received a very positive response to my books and lectures, and uh, but of course it, it's only maybe it's a uh, what you call a confirmation bias or something of that sort, where you uh, uh, take a very selective group of people and look at their responses. That's probably what I'm doing as well. But I've only had positive interactions with people when it comes to the communication of mathematics. Mm. Um, and then maybe finally, would you have any maybe words of advice that you'd like to give, whether they be students or adults who do perhaps have this trepidation towards maths about maybe getting them over that barrier? Ah, how do you get over that barrier? Well, um, so the, uh, I think the barrier uh, may arise and it may be difficult for various reasons. For example, if you want to take an examination, that, uh, that's a challenge and how to meet that, uh, I don't think I can address here right now. If it's a question of just getting excited about mathematics, being interested in it, I think there are interesting methods that I can recommend right now. Take whatever subject you're interested in, almost any subject, right? Mm. And you will find mathematics there somewhere. I've already alluded to this. So, so of course, if you're interested in politics and economics, uh, that will take then uh, So an example I like to use often is people sometimes discuss economic inequality. Right? Mm. There is inequality an issue in many different societies, right? And you ask people, how do they actually measure this inequality, right? Mm. And you, as you start researching this issue, you will find lots of mathematics that you can try to understand in stages. Right? And that will deepen your understanding of the issues that are being discussed in the newspaper. But you can do this with almost anything. But if you're interested in, interested in uh, dinosaurs, some kids are often interested in dinosaurs, <laughs> you can look up uh, paleontology and mathematics. You can take any subject you want and take X and mathematics, right? Mm. And you'll find a lot of interesting literature that will tell you how quantitative and structural thinking is applied to your subject of interest. Right? Mm. And using that hook, you can get more and more deeply into mathematics. I guess nowadays we're surrounded by numbers because of the COVID-19 situation. And that's, Indeed, I that's guess, a, that's very important. Yeah, that's yeah. one way into maths as well, I guess. Finally, Professor, that's a just... Very important example. Sorry, if I could just add one thing, right? Sure. So you're doing this interview right now, right? You can immediately look into a communication and mathematics if you're interested. You'll find lots of interesting literature. <laughs> <laughs> sure, uh, I'll Media definitely... <laughs> sure, that sounds like something I need to look into. Finally, Professor, before yeah. you go, what's your goal as a mathematician now? Uh, what do you look to do from now on? 
Ah, what do I look to do? Yes, uh, sure. Well, I, 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 try, I try, try to enjoy myself day to day mostly. I think I, it's very hard to speak about long term goals. Uh, but I, I did answer that question recently because somebody asked it to me. Uh, when I took on my current position, actually, there was an interview related to that. And I think I said, I'd like to understand what space and time are made out of. And wow. That, partly a joke, but partly serious. <laughs> <laughs> so you're looking to answer the big questions, it seems. Then, well, it's been a delight to have you on the show. Today. It's been a delight to have you on the show today, Professor. And hopefully, it will encourage our listeners to think more about uh, maths and more differently about maths. I guess, and importantly, not to fear it as well. We've been speaking to the mathematician Professor Kim Min Hyung for Touch Base and Soul. Thank you once again for your time today, Professor. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Have a nice day.